you can hear me okay? Oh, that's great. Look, I'm a professor of agricultural business management. Wearing this thing, I feel a bit like Madonna, so if I break out in song, um, <laughs> you'll know why. Yeah. So look, welcome everyone. It is tremendous to see such a huge group of people, um, especially in a time like this, in the drought sort of conditions that you're facing. But it's a really, really good sign. It's, it's optimistic. It says that, you know, you're right into your beef enterprises. You really are getting yourselves set up to make the most of the opportunity. So it's a huge honour to come and talk to you today about what those opportunities are and how you might go about realising um, some of them. But look, um, first things first, you're probably thinking one or two things at the moment. One is... What on earth is a professor of agricultural business management? And how do you get to become one of those? The other thing you're probably thinking is Fully Pal. That's a pretty strange sort of a name. I wonder where this bloke comes from. So I'll start with the second one first. Um, uh. Okay, we'll go to this. That's, the, that's what I look like when I'm doing the professor gig normally. Um, but, okay, so Fully Power. Um, it actually comes from Western Samoa, beautiful little island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, some famous people come from there. Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. Okay. Um, Moana, you know, the cartoon, the sea goddess, and, uh, and my father. Now, you know how we have names like the tailor, because great-great-granddad was really good at making suits, and the miller, because they made flour, and the baker, because they were really good at baking bread. Well, the Samoan sort of had the same thing with surnames, except they sort of named you after what you weren't good at not what you were good at. And translated in Psalm, fale means house, and pau means fall down. <laughs> so at a very early age, it was pretty clear I wasn't going to have a career building anything. So I sort of thought, well, why don't I have a career growing something or try out growing something? So I think that's where I got my passion for agriculture. Um, so the first thing I did... Um, when I left high school, and believe me, back at that time, it couldn't happen soon enough, I got out and I did what was called a trade certificate in farming in sheep and beef in the North Island of New Zealand. Um, the New Zealanders back then had worked out that, that farming, growing sheep and beef, converting grass into meat, was a bit like a trade. You needed to have the hands-on practical experience and live through the production of beef and sheep. And at the same time, it didn't hurt to learn a bit of the theory about how animals actually worked and the sorts of things you could do to manage them. So it was just like, it was run by the New Zealand Trade Certification Board, um, just like plumbers and electricians, and I did that for four years, two different sheep and cattle stations in the North Island of New Zealand. Um, now look, on the second station, it was pretty large. Um, the shearers used to come in for a couple of weeks, um, they used to earn more in a day than I earned in two months. Um, and I had become pretty handy with a handpiece, so I thought, I wound that up, I finished the four years, got the trade certificate, and I went shearing for four years. Shearing and fencing, you know the New Zealanders turn everything into a competition? So I aspired to win the golden double. They have this golden shears competition, and they have this golden pliers competition. That sort of drove me for about four years. Um, fortuitously, the shearing took me over to Western Australia in the middle of a, I think it was said to be one of the worst droughts in the history of Australia, shearing those great big red-eyed merino weathers, my hand locked up. I got tendonitis. Um, again, fortuitously, at that time, there were a whole lot of people in Australia that actually had quite a bit of money and thought it would be a good idea to develop a deer industry in Australia. And as I said, they were quite willing to pay for that. So I actually switched, got out of the shearing, and I spent four years setting up deer farms. I was actually up at Scone 
for a little while, setting up deer farms um, in New South Wales, importing live red deer from New Zealand to Australia, and then eventually on um, to Korea. So that was sort of, I guess, my first taste at actually managing businesses and industry development and how whole value chains sort of work. Um, again, gee, I've been a lucky bloke. Again, fortuitously, I didn't get my fingers burnt out of that as the industry sort of started to commercialise. In fact, I'd actually managed to put enough money away to fund my own way through university. So I did a, um, a degree in agriculture um, at University of Western Sydney. I loved it so much I went on and did a PhD. Um, it's a research sort of qualification. I studied this funny little thing called ecchymosis, a little rupture of muscle blood vessels in meat and learned all about meat quality and that sort of thing. Um, Look, with all of that, with an Australian tertiary education, an Australian wife and a child born in Australia, I did what you'd expect me to do. I went back to New Zealand. Um, I consulted. I worked as a consultant in New Zealand for a couple of years, or a year and a half. Didn't like it. Moved back to Australia. Um, I, was, I led meat, a meat research, um, sheep meat research program in central western Queensland for three years. Again, another experience at businesses, at new industries. Uh, it was looking at dameras and dorpers and all of those funny things were coming into Australia, um, into the pastoral zone. So I led a research program to investigate whether or not there were merits for those sort of production systems or those sort of sheep in those sort of areas. Um, from that I then... Uh, took a job and worked for six years for Meat and Livestock Australia, um, managing their southern beef research and development program on farm bit and looking after the goat, national goat R&D program. And I also did a couple of stints um, in the processing sector R&D programs as well. Now, the great thing about all of that was I got to travel the length, length and breadth of Australia to almost every single town like Singleton, and I saw literally thousands of farm businesses and got to observe the way people actually managed them you know, over quite a period of time, through droughts and coming out of droughts, through the whole spectrum. Um, then I left uh, Meat and Livestock Australia and I went into the private sector. I spent about four years, five years in the private sector um, managing um, some small to medium businesses, right through to what culminated in, I guess, the extreme business experience, and that was as the Chief Executive Officer uh, restructuring a state-owned enterprise, uh, meat processing and export company in the middle of Africa. Um, extreme experience. Um, I'd say I often wonder why on earth did I, did I do that? How did I end up doing that? I'd actually, I'd managed to... You know, I had profit and loss accountability and managed a, a small to medium business that was really struggling financially. And I remember, you know, managing cash flow on a daily basis. Oh, you've got the phone in one ear talking to a debtor. You've got the phone in the other talking to a creditor. You know, it's just... And I remember coming out of that and going, I am never, ever, ever going to get in a position like that again, ever. And for some reason, I found myself on a plane to Johannesburg after reading four years of annual financial statements going into a business that was technically insolvent. Um, but I think that's one of the big lessons about, about building your business skills, about getting really good at it, is that it's often the really extreme times that you work through that give you the greatest insights about how your business operates, what the real drivers are. It's not too hard to manage a beef enterprise when things are going really well, you know, when you have 100 mils of rainfall. It's really tough to manage it when it's not going so well. And so I think those extreme adventures are something that we need to look at and go, this is a really good thing. This is what actually teaches us about the business. Um, the other two great things about the gig in Africa um, was, believe me, when you come back to Australia and you hop off that plane and you arrive back on your little farm in Wagga, mate, the world could not be better. 
you actually, being overseas in those sort of environments and appreciating the environment that a lot of your contemporaries, farmers over there have to deal with, you get back to Australia and all of a sudden, all of the things that we take for granted, we actually see as huge, huge, huge opportunities. Um, so look, if you ever get the chance, believe, or you need to make the chance, I think, it is, get on a plane and go overseas and experience agriculture in some of those other countries. Now, not a five-star resort sort of holiday, but just actually go there and have a look and see how their industries operate and look at the challenges that they've got. Um, you know, the other thing is, of course, you get overseas and you actually see the markets that 60, 80% of our production goes into. And so you get a picture of what the whole value chain looks like, what consumers actually want, and you can bring that back here and start focusing your business on delivering to that. So that's how I ended up basically. Oh, we came back to Australia, or back to our place in, in Wagga Wagga, and I got a position as the inaugural professor of agricultural business management. So what does that mean? What do I actually do? I thought, look, probably the quickest way to do that was just I'll tell you what I teach my students. Um, and you can even give me some feedback on that because thinking about the future of, of agriculture, the beef industry, it is in the students that I'm teaching that are the future. So it would be great to get some feedback from you later on if you think I'm doing the right thing in what I teach them. Um, so as a group of our students, and I guess what I really do as a professor of agricultural business management, I share the experiences I've had across the world from shepherd right through to CEO, across the whole value chain from the farm right through to the market, and internationally, I share all those experiences with the students, or at least those that will listen to me, um, and try and share that experience and help them learn and understand how to manage their businesses. So look, at Charles Sturt University, we enrol about 200 new students each year to study agricultural science and agricultural business management. 80% of them are from regional, they actually come off farms. Um, and so this is, this is pretty much what I, what I talk to them, what I teach them about. Oh, when I was invited to come and speak to you guys, Andrew wanted me to speak about business, agricultural farm businesses and risk management. Um, Justine wanted me to talk about opportunities for the future of ag to 2040 and all that sort of thing. I wanted to talk about things that were a bit more exciting, like foot and mouth disease outbreaks, being interrogated by the Directorate of Crime and Economic Corruption in Africa. So I thought I might actually see if I can sort of talk about all of them in some way. But anyway, this is what I tell the students that come to learn about managing a business, farm business. The first one is that agriculture, or, or in agriculture, you have to understand the entire value chain, right from the farm, right through the consumer. You know, most of the things that we produce that consumers buy, they won't buy, they can't buy them. There's the, what we produce on the farm, we produce grass, we actually have to turn it into meat to make it something that a consumer wants, and then very often a whole lot of other people have to do stuff to it to make it of value to the consumer. So you can't operate, you can't manage a business in, in a value chain, in, in agriculture, unless you actually understand the entire value chain. Um, because you've got to produce something that the next person can add some value to right through to the consumer. Oh, great. Um, the next thing they sort of ask, oh, what agricultural business management, you know, what, what is that? What do you mean by that? And I go, well, look, business management, there are generic skills you need for business, and you could go and do a generic business management course, you know, and there are plenty of them. Charles Sturt University has a Bachelor of Business Management um, and you learn these four sets of skills that you people are all really good at. Managing the people that work in the business, including yourself. Having the financial skills to understand with numbers what's going on in the business and how it's performing. The planning and organisational skills, the chief operating officer running the business, running the operation that produces whatever it is you produce. 
And then, of course, the sales and marketing skills to make sure that you maximise the revenue from whatever it is you've done. You've got to learn all those skills. The unique thing about, and why I say you need to, if you want to learn those skills, you need to learn them as they apply to agriculture, is because of this. So businesses, every business is exposed to what we call market volatility. And volatility is not high or low, it's that it can be anywhere in between and it's really hard to predict. So we all have market volatility. The unique thing with ag is we have often more if not, well, we have as much if not more volatility at the raw material end of the supply chain and of our businesses. And that's the major raw material we know now for sure is rain. And old Huey's the one that decides how much he's going to give us and he doesn't want to tell us in advance how much he's going to give us or how little he's going to give us. So that's the unique thing about agriculture. We actually have to understand the biological system, the production system and what all its drivers are. Probably no matter where you work in the value chain to be able to manage that bit in between. And you have to be really, really adept at planning, at observing what's going on, revising the plan, having a plan B, having a plan C, and then putting those in place as things unfold. So that's why I say if you want to learn about agricultural business, you need to learn about it as it applies to agriculture. You need to understand the primary production system and the entire value chain that goes with it. Look, on that on that volatility, and it goes beyond just the farm and managing the farm. When I was in Africa as an expatriate, um, I got to know other expatriates and there was a um, chief executive officer of their big diamond mine was there at the same time. We used to swap notes all the time. Remember when the global financial crisis hit? You know what he did with the diamond mine? He just reduced the extraction rate. He just started shutting the mine down. They didn't need to pull the mines out of the ground, the diamonds out of the ground, because they don't go off, they just sit there. Right? Six months into my stint in, in Botswana in Africa, we lost our EU market access. 60% of our supply went into the EU, 80% of our revenues came from the EU, and we lost it overnight. The EU inspectors came over and said, your livestock traceability system doesn't work, we're taking you off the list. You haven't got export market accreditation. Right, swapping notes with Jim, Jim said, oh, yeah, no worries, mate, you just, you just stop slaughtering. I said, I can't, I've got 40,000 cattle in a feedlot, I can't just shut them down and say, oh, just hang in there for a while and just wait. We've got to, we have a biological system, we've got to keep slaughtering them. 40,000 cattle in a feedlot with no market for them. And then I even thought, he's thinking, wow, we still had to pull diamonds out of the ground, we couldn't sell them, we just left them in the vault. They could sit there for as long as you like. He said, you've just chopped the heads off 40,000 cattle. They're sitting in a cold store. And every day they sit in there, you lose a day of shelf life until they're not worth anything. He go, wow. Oh, mate, get out of that game. Come over and work in the mining sector. I employed a chief, uh, chief finance officer out of the mining sector. Same thing, we de-stocked um, Nami Land, a red zone. I managed to pull the unbelievable, I got a market for meat out of a foot and mouth disease uh, up into Angola and DRC. And the chief finance officer is going, great, 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 buy cattle, buy cattle, slaughter them, slaughter them, get them into there. I said, oh, I will, I will, I will. He said, cash is not a problem, we've got the money, do it. I said, they're not there. Remember, we slaughtered everything. You know, we, we've got to wait, we've got to breed up heifers, we've got to get them in calf. You know, we're three, four years before we have something that we can put into that market. Again, that's the volatility, that's the challenge of managing an agricultural business or something in agriculture. Again, you've got to understand that biological system and get really good and understand what drives the farm business. So look, um, I talk to our students, I say you've got to develop, I teach them these four sets of skills. Unique again, I think, largely to agriculture, to farm businesses, because every business needs these four these four positions. Chief executive officer that comes to days like this and thinks strategically about the business. The chief finance officer that knows and measures how the business is going and can provide advice and insight into how we can do it better. 
the general manager for marketing and sales, so you can maximise the revenues, and the chief operating officer, the person that makes sure that everything's done, that has the calendar of operations that says we're going to do this on this day. You need those four positions, and the unique thing about ag is the family farm is the predominant business model. The small to medium farm. So the other challenge I say to our students, you've got to learn how to be the best at one or two of those, how to make sure you've got people on your team that are really good at the others, and you've got to manage and coordinate the whole lot. Um, so our, our course, the students actually graduate by putting together a strategic plan for a farm business um, that pulls together all of those skills and measures their competency in them. Um, that's what a business plan looks like. It's saying this is what the business is going to look like in five years' time, and then this is what we're going to do every year to get to that point, what we're going to invest, what we're going to reinvest, and so on, all the way along. That's what the business planning is, and that's what managing an agricultural business has to look like. Um, now, remember, Andrew asked me to talk about risk and managing risk, so I will. I'll, this, look, risk is what I just talked about, risk management. It's actually the act of planning, implementing, observing what's going on, reflecting on it, and replanning. That's what risk management is. That's what the International Standards Organisation say management is and risk management is. Um, so how does that work into the context of, of agriculture? Look, Graham McConnell over in WA did, a, a sort of, did some work with their benchmarking group with a whole lot of, of producers, this was in grain, and looked at you know, how do they manage and how do they manage risk. And this is what he found. It's interesting. In the really poor years, and this was 2006, 2012, you see everybody actually made you know, a loss in 2006. And even when it was a bit better than that, they still didn't do too well. But there wasn't a huge gap between the best performing businesses and the poorer performing businesses when things weren't so good. When things were really good in 2008, I think 2011, you can see the best performing businesses did three, four, five times better than the not quite as good performing businesses. So there's a big lesson in that. When we talk about managing drought, I, I sort of go, it's not really risk management, that's all the negative bit. It's actually how do you exploit and set your business up to make the most out of and maximise the opportunities when the seasons do go your way, when things are going really well. That's what I said, drought management. It's not what you do in the drought. There's nothing we can do at the moment. It's actually what we learn from it and what we do when we come out of it so our businesses are set up to get through the next one. It's how we maximise things when they are going really well. Um, so, look, the sorts of things that those producers did, you know, it, they reduce their weed seed bank, they make sure they have water holding capacity, conserve moisture, soil fertility spot on, Everything's set up so when it does rain, they do really, really, really well and they make super profits. Um, they spend a lot of time planning, a lot of time they know they have a plan A, plan B, plan C for when the season isn't going so well and so on. They survive the good years, or the poor years, sorry, they really exploit the good ones so that they are in a position to grow their businesses. They remove as much of the guesswork as you possibly can. Um, plan the business around what happens more often than not, and then have plan A, plan B, plan C when things don't go as well as planned or much better than planned. Um, so how does that translate then into a beef, into grazing businesses? Same thing, setting your business up to make the most out of the really good years. Make sure you've got your soil in the top condition. It's got good water holding capacity, good organic matter. So every millimetre of rainfall that does fall actually does go into growing the grass or the plant. Reduce the weeds. Make sure your soil fertility is as good as it can be. Get the right pastures to handle or to maximise growth in those good years. Maintain the ground cover and so on and so on. So all the things that we know to do to make sure that we make the most out of every millimetre of rainfall that falls. Um, 
And then again, you make decisions on two. On a lot of students who go, oh, yeah, 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 sure, but there's nothing you can do. You can't change a lot of things. Well, you can't. You make two levels of decisions. You make your enterprise strategy. You choose to be a beef producer rather than a lamb producer. You choose to have a mix of enterprises based on what usually happens, what seasons look like more often than not. And you base that decision probably more on intuition and experience than anything else. It's then that the measuring and monitoring and recording comes into play. It's as the seasons unfold, you start making tactical decisions within those strategies about what to do. So I say that that's, you set your enterprise strategy for what happens more often than not, and then you just keep running little scenarios. What if, as the season unfolds, I get two poor seasons, you know, a poor winter and a poor spring on top of each other? What happens if I get a good autumn break and then no winter? You just keep running those scenarios through. You go, what tactics would I employ? And that's what gives you your plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. And you can sleep at night because you know already in advance what you are going to do as the season unfolds. So enterprise strategy, by that I mean you set up your calendar of operations. What does your herd and flock structure look like? When are you going to carve? You know, when are you going to put the bulls out and so on? What markets are you going to supply? What are the target markets and what do you need to do to supply them? And then how are you going to provide the feed? The feed supply, what pastures will you have? Will you conserve fodder or not? And again, you set all that up to maximise things as the seasons are more often than not. Okay? And then you start looking at what tactics will I employ if they don't. Again... You know, the, I think the key one, it's not what you do in the drought, it's more how you set up to get out of it when things come good. And so for a grazing enterprise, again, it's, it's a grass factory. You've got to look after the factory so it's fully operational and ready to go when the major raw material rainfalls there. So you've got to avoid, you know, we say maximise pasture utilisation, that's great. That's an easy thing to do because things are really good. What you have to make sure you do is not that. Kill the factory Um, because that's the thing that affects your ability to work your way out of it. Now, remember I said I wanted to talk about about the opportunities for Justine for the future of the beef industry going forward? Well, I thought for a bit of fun, I was working at MLA way back in 2002 and we did some scenario planning that was looking forward and saying, what might the year 2020 look like? And I thought, hey, it might be fun to go back and say, what did we think back in 2020 when we're now just about in 2019? So I dug out, the, I've managed to find the old, um, you know, the overhead projector thingies and I turned them into PowerPoints. And, and um, these were the three scenarios that we had for beef. One was to Asia with love. We would be a major supplier into Asia high value added products into their wealthy emerging part of their economy, lots of innovation and process, highly networked, you know, high value niche markets, ultra clean green image and all of that. Well, hey, guess what? We're doing that. You know, we've got markets that are actually investing in our value chains, having a real part of the whole thing. The other scenario was this corporate cowboys. Hey, increased institutional investment in agriculture, large-scale operations, multi-property portfolios with a real corporate approach to attracting investment and producing beef. Um, Supplying into really integrated supply chains, possibly owning the whole supply chain, all of that. Well, hey, what? I reckon that's happening now too. And then... There was this third one, Rural Sleepers Awaken. And this was still small-scale operations, you know, the family farm, not necessarily integrated in the great big export supply chains, regional, local, farmer's market sort of stuff, community food, all of that. So this is eventuated as well. When I thought about it, I thought, well, it's actually because we've had the capacity to realise the opportunities that were existing in 2002 
to turn out the industry and what we want it to look like that it could possibly be. So it's not actually about going, what are we going to look like in 2020? It's more, what are you going to turn the industry into in 2040? What will it look like if you capture the opportunities that exist right now for the industry? So with that, I just wanted to share then, I guess what I see as the biggest opportunities for the beef industry going forward based on what I've seen overseas, based on what it appears or where we appear to be at right now. Um, and the first one of those is that we have this huge opportunity to continue to sell our products into the high value market segments that exist overseas. So I'm not talking about those that um, you know, we compete with lots of other countries. They're the ones where the, the consumer doesn't look at the price tag of the food that they're buying. In fact, they don't even buy it. They generally eat in restaurants and somebody else cooks it. They buy the whole experience. You now, we have a unique opportunity to continue to position our businesses and the value adding along the chain to supply that market segment. Um, why I say we've got a huge opportunity to do that is that we have the technology, we have the systems, we have the support in our industry structures. We have research and development, we have LLSs, we have all of those sort of organisations that support to be able to run the systems that enable us to supply and satisfy all of those other values that consumers that don't care what they pay, they want. They want to know where it comes from, they want to be, some of them like to watch, they want to see who grew their food, they want to know who did that, they want to know who processed it and where it's... They want all of that, and we actually have the best systems in the world to be able to deliver all of that. So look, that's one of the big opportunities, um, is to deliver what I call on time, in full, the specification. Dave and Sarah will teach you all about producing to specification, but there are other people here that have the tools and the knowledge to help you work out how do you work in the whole supply chain? Right, there's a KLR marketing here. We'll talk about marketing and channels to market and that sort of thing. There are others that, that there's my grazing. It's another one that helps you measure and monitor how you're producing and will you deliver on time. Um, so we've got all of the access to those sort of technologies to be able to deliver not just what people want, but exactly when they want it and exactly how much they want. And that's what's really important particularly food service sector, particularly that top end, where you're serving meals in restaurants. You can't not have it when you, when you need it. Um, so that's the big one. The other one is that access to markets is huge. When Christy Arnott gets up and talks to you about biosecurity and managing, making sure you've got market access, don't say, oh, really? When she says jump, you should say how high. You absolutely need to maintain the systems that we have that guarantee us those opportunities into those markets. Look, the second big opportunity, I think, absolutely, is there is a real appetite for people that want to invest in agriculture. So the next big opportunity that you need to seize, that I think we can seize, is you get yourself investor ready. So there, is, yeah, there was a report by ANZ, Future for Agriculture, you know, something like $7.9 billion is needed to be invested in ag for us to realise all the opportunities. And that money is actually there, but you have to get your business in a position where somebody actually wants to invest in it. You need to develop and get skilled in developing the business plans. The things that will tell somebody that invests money in your business how much they're going to make, what the risks are to the money that they put into your business, and then give them the confidence that you've got the ability to manage the risks in that investment. Um, you've got to develop, you know, this. Have the skills and time to build a business plan. Just, to, just one little example. Look, you know, I chair the board of a family company that have grown now their assets from five million to 25 million, and it's actually been all off the back of the biggest investor that we have, generally, and that's debt finance. That's just the banks. 
Now, remember years ago, you, you couldn't talk to your bank manager about getting a bit more money unless you're at 90% equity. Well, we're down to 67% equity. Now, I asked the bank manager, because he's going, at the last AGM, he's going, look, we're ready to go when you are. You want another acquisition. We're in there. And I asked him, what, what is it that we've done to be that investor ready that you're prepared to go even further? And he said, oh, you've been doing this, we've been doing this with you for 15 years. You've got records for the last 15 years of every single bit of your business. You've been able to demonstrate how you got through the last drought and how you made an absolute mozza when we had two really good years in a row. And you've got all of those records there. You've got one brother that, that does part-time as the chief executive officer. He's spotting the opportunities and making sure that they're wise investments and things. You've got others that are definitely the farm manager, the experts, the chief operating officers. You've got another brother that focuses and all he does is the marketing and sales. He said, you're managing this like a business and we can see that it's a safe investment. That's what, he's, that's what Investor Ready is. Look, I work, do it quite a bit overseas with institutional investors. You know, it's not much to go past that to be able to speak the language that they want to hear, calculate net present value, internal rate of return, again, quantify the risks and give them a good feel for what that is. So that's, I think, the, the, you know, probably the biggest opportunity that we've got with, is, is access to capital and positioning your businesses to be investor ready. Um, look, I hope that gave you a bit of insight into or what a professor of agricultural business management does, um, but also some insight into what we can be thinking about now on a day like this before we go back to our farms, to feed cattle or sheep or whatever it is, but think very much about how do we now learn from this experience and go forward to capture the opportunities that are just sitting there right around the corner. Thank you very much. Thank you.